Good evening, y'all, and welcome to our second Mercy Night for this fall, for the spring Lenten season. Let's begin with a little bit of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of reconciliation, forgiveness, and penance. This whole great exercise that you've given us to not only participate in and practice, but also be the practitioners of. We ask you, Lord, this evening in a special way you might give us grace to examine our lives more fully and be better prepared not only for the sacrament of reconciliation, but for life in general. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. By way of review, remember that this Lent we are reviewing our uh, drawing inspiration or I am, and you're just receiving, the inspiration drawn from the new rite of penance. Last week, I did an introduction. If you weren't with us, you can um, go back on the internet and, and watch the backup backlog. Tonight, we'll be talking about the examination, which is, by definition, what happens before the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And then finally, we will do a week on the contrition, the absolution, and then satisfaction, or what you might know as penance. That's the roadmap for where we're going. And understanding where we are going and where we have been, you can understand where we're going tonight. You may have heard this quote, as so many things from the ancient world are. Um, supposedly, this comes from Socrates. However, it is totally possible that it came from somebody else hundreds, if not a thousand years later that the examined life is not worth living. Of course, Socrates, the great philosopher, was one who spent much time examining his own life. Having gone to the oracle at Delphi and asked who is the wisest person in the world and receiving back the most horrifying answer possible, you are, for a seeker of knowledge and wisdom, this was awful for Socrates. There was no one he could go learn from. And yet, he tried to disprove the oracle throughout his entire life and was always met with disappointment. Through his questions, he examined the thoughts of others, often revealing that they did not know the thing they thought they knew so well, quite as well as they thought they did. Now, if you've ever done advanced studies in anything, you've probably run into the wall of, there is a limit to what human beings can know about any one topic, and here's mine. And I recall my, my own study of calculus. You know there's three cl calculus classes at the collegiate level? And then differential equations is after that, and there's like another math after that. I hit a wall in calculus too, where I, there were some concepts I just couldn't grasp. And there was a moment where I went, okay, you know what? This is, this is my limit. I'm going to try to pass this class. This is the last math class I have to take for my degree field. I'm going to be okay knowing this amount. Now, Socrates' great instinct was not about knowing everything about everything, but about knowing that you can always know more, or more importantly, understand better the things that you already know. For the sake of a fuller definition, an examination is any act of applying reason or brain power or thought and discernment or judgment to a phenomenon. All that means is I see and see is code for Experience, so any of our senses. I sense something in the outer world and I try to make sense of it in my mind and I ask myself, is this true? That's what I mean by an examination. The phenomenon can be literally anything. Events of your life, raw data. You know, there are people that stare at spreadsheets all day and make sense of this stuff. It could be the stuff you get in interpersonal interactions with other people. You know, somebody is telling you one thing, but they're 
their facial expression just doesn't give the same feeling as what they're saying. Your own feelings, the trends of the world, on and on. There's some, something you get with your senses that I now have in my mind, and my mind chews on it, and then tries to understand what I have experienced and applies the basic judgment of, is this true or not? Trying to find out what the actual truth is. Now, examination is the basis for absolutely all of the most important aspects of human culture. All of them. All of them. When, a, when an examination is aimed at the physical world, that becomes science. When it's aimed at human actions, it becomes ethics. When it's with the relationship between peoples, it becomes economics, sociology, government. When it's aimed at religious truths, this becomes contemplation or meditation. When it's aimed at thought, it becomes a, a deeper form of meditation. And at almost every level of human experience, examination can result surprisingly in art. All of the best pieces of human culture are based on incredible application of this very simple principle of examination. I look at the world, I engage it in my own mind, in my heart, I apply all of my interior powers and faculties to that experience, and I try and understand it, I try and interact with it, I try and make use of it, I try and explain it and do something with it. And probably at no more important level has this ever been expressed in the very simple words, and Mary kept all of these things in her heart. This, of course, is the ancient paradigm of Christian contemplation and meditation. To take the things that Jesus Christ has done, to take the things God has done, keep them close to my chest, and the most important ones, to pull them out from time to time and look at them. Whether it's your own life experience, the stories recounted to us in sacred scripture, the great teachings of the Catholic faith, the writings of the mystics, the great spiritual classics from the dawn of, of, of Christianity, or your own life experience, the history of the church, or anything. Nature, art, even art that was not explicitly Christian or even inherently Christian. To bring that back and chew on it and ask the Lord, what does this mean? Some of you may remember the rather famous video on YouTube from some number of years back now of the man who saw the double rainbow and just seems to have lost his mind. It's a double rainbow all the way across the sky. And almost at the tail end of that video, he, he says just very quietly, what does this mean? That is examination. Now, I want to talk about two really powerful tools where you make use of examination. On your way in the church this morning, this morning, this afternoon, you, you noticed there was the handout, which is what we traditionally have for, um, for Mercy Nights, but we also had two uh, pamphlets. This smaller one is a tool called the Examine Prayer, the Daily Examine, or the Examination of Consciousness. It comes to us from the mind of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Famously, as he was convalescing from a cannonball wound and his leg that was broken because of it, he had a very extensive healing process because his leg wasn't healing correctly, so he had the doctors break it again so that he could heal properly. He was laid up for a long time. And he noticed during this process that when he spent his days thinking about what the saints had done in the book of the lives of the saints that he read, he went to bed that day uplifted, encouraged, 
He felt close to the Lord. And when he spent his day reading about knights and chivalry and thinking about a particular noble woman or daughter of a noble family whom he wished to woo and marry, he went to bed upset, low, and sad. Not that either of these two two things was better or worse than the other. You can imagine a life in which Ignatius of Loyola had maybe been a married man, lived a very healthy and important life, become maybe even an important noble or governor in his own world, but not the great founder of the companions of Jesus. Not the great father of the Jesuits, because he didn't listen to this. His fundamental intuition, which is at the foundation of the entire exercise, is that there are some things that pull you towards the Lord and some things that pull you away from the Lord. And you ought to use your mind to discern the things that pull you towards the Lord so that you can embrace them with your own free will and the things that pull you away from the Lord that you might ignore them. Simple enough. His tool for doing this comes in two parts. The more difficult of the parts is the 14 rules for the discernment of spirits. The significantly easier piece is this daily exam. This is a tool that will help you live your life not in an episodic way, but in a narrative form. Here's what I mean. That's my fancy way of saying that because I like to say the word narrative and episodic. The Simpsons is episodic. There are episodes they have nothing to do with each other, except it's the same characters caught in different scenarios. Any sitcom is that way, but it's not a narrative. And some people live this way. They wake up every day as if it was a brand new day with no connection to yesterday and no connection to tomorrow, and they just hope to see what the Lord will provide them that day. Of course, that's the, that's the best possible version of that. Some people wake up and go, oh, what is this fresh new hell that I'm going to experience today? I've I've met people like that, right? Then there is the narrative story. The West Wing. The Sopranos. Smallville. I'm running out of examples. Um, The Game of Thrones. These are, this is a story that's going somewhere. It's not these little tiny things, but each individual thing is a reality of its, of its own, sure. But it builds from the last and builds to the next. And just like television, some of your days are going to be better or worse than others. And some seasons may be better or worse than others. This is a tool to transition you from an episodic way of living to a narrative way of living. Here's how you do it. It's really, really simple. These cards are on the middle table in the back of the church. Take them home. They're for you. Um, Thank Father Mark, who made them a long time ago. We still have a million of them left over. This is one of the most powerful tools for prayer that the church has ever given us. The idea is very simple. You sit down to pray. You intentionally transition yourself from whatever you were just doing into the posture of prayer. And this sounds silly, but it is super important to be able to say things like, I am now praying. Sounds silly, huh? But trust me, if you don't do stuff like that, you will keep doing whatever was the last thing you were doing. You're sitting down to pray and you're thinking about the food. You're sitting down to pray and you're worrying about the bill. You're sitting down to pray and you're worried about tomorrow. Give yourself a break. Turn that off. Transition. Shift gears. Then the steps after that are very simple. Practice gratitude. This is probably the most important piece. Look back on your day. What were you grateful for? Not what you should have been grateful for. That is a deeply unhelpful experience. Trust me, I have lived that hell. What you were grateful for. And when you start this, I guarantee you the answers are going to be, they're going to sound pathetic to you. My first experience was a list of things that I was supposed to be grateful for. Did not help. In fact, was really not life-giving. Second day, all I could think of, no joke, was the one cup of coffee I had that morning. Sad, huh? 
But by the end of the week, my capacity for gratitude had grown dramatically. So you start there. Think back over your day. What am I grateful for? And say thank you. Second step is to petition the Lord. You ask the Lord, Lord, help me to see you the way you see me. I said that wrong. I'm sorry. Lord, help me to see me the way you see me. I'm examining myself. Lord, give me the light to see myself the way you see me. Not the way I see me. Not the way the world sees me. Not in in depression or uh, criticism, but in reality. Then review your day. What happened? What were the major movements of the day? What were your major feelings? What were your major desires? What were your major thoughts? If you think of the day as a, just a, like a wave, what are the peaks? What are the, what are the things that stick out to you? You'll notice the places where you don't measure up. You'll notice those places. When you notice them, ask for forgiveness. And then offer this prayer of renewal. Lord, this is what I desire to do differently tomorrow. Help tomorrow be better than today. And here's how it connects the days. Because at the end of the day, you're looking back at what's just happened and projecting into the future. Our actions have consequences. They have eternal consequences. The place you're at right now is the result of everything that has ever happened to you and everything you've chosen to do. And you, right now, are living the consequences of decisions past you made. And that is a thing that you can get deeply frustrated with. Let me tell you this. It's easy to think about how, darn it, past me committed me to too many things. And overlook the fact that present you is going to be past you for a future you. You can't undo any of the decisions you've made, but you can make better decisions for the future. You cannot undo any decisions you've already made, but you can do better for the future. Stop worrying about what's happened. And instead, focus on, okay, what can I do now? Powerful, powerful tool. The second tool that's in the back is the examination of conscience. This is the thing you probably thought I was going to talk about at length for the whole evening. And I'm not going to because you have a wonderful little handout right here. You use this. It's a great little tool. I want to give you um, something even more foundational. This is a great tool for when you don't know what to say. These are a great tool, and this is just one example. This is our examination of conscience here at Christ the Redeemer. There's one on EWTN's website that's fantastic. Um, they're available in a whole bunch of different places. However, these things are extensive, and they say a lot of things in them that probably are not going to be helpful for you. So if you are already in the habit of making regular confession, your practice of examination of your own life is probably more advanced than what this can help you with. Okay, what are you doing when you're examining your conscience? At its most fundamental level, you're looking at your sins. You are looking at what are the things that I have done that are wrong or evil or not loving or however you want to say it. Especially those that are serious, you know they're wrong and you chose to do it anyway. These, of course, are the three criteria for mortal sin. The thing is a grave matter. I understood that it was a grave matter, and I freely chose to do it anyway. What this means is that ignorance reduces the culpability of a major mortal sin. It doesn't remove it, it just reduces it. This also means that compulsion reduces, and in some cases may eliminate, the sinful nature of an action. I suggest that if it does get to that point, it's actually changed the nature of the action, rather than simply made it not a sin. You know, somebody sitting there with, an, a, with a taser and has your hand tied to a gun and shocks your arm so that you pull the trigger. That's not murder. That's something entirely different. It is murder on the part of the dude with the taser and whoever taped your hand together and all of those people. Now, these are stupid examples. I understand that. 
but it, it helps better explain the central concept. We can split hairs all we want. There are things I know are wrong and I still chose to do them anyway. And I'm not alone. Here is some really, really simple practical advice for your examination of conscience. Start with the worst first, whatever is the biggest thing. Whether it's uh, the darkest thing you've ever done or simply the biggest thing, again, if you're thinking about like a wave chart, what, what are the spikes? You know, for one person, it might be, um, I, I can't shake this habitual habit, uh, vice. For another person, it might be, I skipped mass. For another person, it might be, uh, fornication or contraception. And for another person, it's going to be murder. It's probably not any of those really extreme things. Although I want to say that list of things I gave, not all of them were extreme, right? It may not be any of the extreme things, but it's the worst thing for you. Coupled with that is, what do you want help with? If you want help with a thing, you probably want to either start or end with the thing you want help with. Now that is merely practical advice so that you can help me help you. In, in, in hearing confessions, I hear a lot of confessions. Sometimes the person finishes speaking and I have no clue what to tell them. Surprising, huh? If you come to confession enough with me, and I told you something I've already said before, probably didn't know what to say to you. Sometimes, um, particularly if the person has a confession that's written out, not, it all sounds kind of flat and the same. But if you tell me what you want help with, I will most certainly try and give you the best help I can on that thing. Look at the weight. What is the thing that it's a burden, and it's always a burden. And you don't feel like you can shake it. And while those things may be the content, certainly, of uh, more long-form sort of spiritual direction or even counseling, often there can be a great reprieve given in the Sacrament of Reconciliation. What are your past sins that you don't understand or that still haunt you? There may be some guilt or shame that we can talk about and help uh, eliminate. Then, of course, if you don't know what to do after that, then you go grab one of these and you read it. Now, I want to give you some advice about these things. These things, these printed, written examination of conscience, are they have a limitation to them. They are trying to speak to the widest possible audience to help as many people as possible. What that means is not everything that's written on this paper is of equal weight or value, and most of this is probably not going to apply to you. And I know as I've used these things in the past, they tend to be quite long, and after about three quarters of the way, my eyes are, you know, just crossed, and I, I can't read anymore. I can't think, I can't process. You probably want to give yourself more time for the longer that you've been away. And once you've used one of these, use a different one next time. And use a third one after that. Not that you're going to, not that you're going to look at three different examination of conscience for one confession, no. But as you go from confession to confession, it's good to get a different list. Because I guarantee you, they all say different things. If a thing doesn't help you, throw it away. Move on. This evening, we're going to have plenty of time. On your handout, I give you some other advice. I give you a little uh, bit of, of uh, text from the uh, right of penance. Um, and then certainly you have access to these two hand, uh, uh, peripherals there in the back of the church. As, I, as we always do, this time is for you. Between you and the Lord. Wherever the Lord has you, stay there. Wherever the Lord has you, go there. However, if you don't know where else to go, it would not be a bad time to sit and do a more thorough examination of conscience so that you might be able to better understand where the Lord has you and help you grow in faith. So, you might use this time to examine your conscience, prepare yourself for reconciliation, or prepare your heart for Easter as it is still three or four weeks away, but 
quite honestly, you'll blink and it'll be here. Today is, this time is for you. Use it. Use it to grow close to the Lord. Use it to better understand yourself.